Okay. In this week's podcast, we have uh, quite a bit of stuff to talk about. We're going to attempt again to uh, impose a little structure on the chaos that is our existence. The swirling void. void. Yeah, we're back. We're back. So... Uh, The first segment, last week we did a segment where we talked about what we were reading. Uh, This week, Grace and I actually got out to see a movie. (gasps) (laughs) And it was a first-run movie. That's what's, yeah, we we never get to see first-run movies. It's always in the cheap cheap seats at the uh, second-run theater. (laughs) And it's been, the last first-run movie we saw was just about a year ago. Yeah, a little a little under a year ago. Yeah, it was December. Uh, and we saw that was our second. I I had seen it already. Right. But I took you to see Arrival, mm-hmm. which was a beautiful, beautiful film. It was a good movie. I, I really like it yeah, still. It was a good movie. And um, I I do have to criticize one thing in Arrival though. Okay. There's no way she could afford arrived. that house. <laughs> she could never afford that house. Oh, as a it was ridiculous as an adjunct professor, as a single adjunct, or please. or whatever she was, even tenured. Yeah. yeah, it's that's just a it's such a common thing in movies in the main um, character lives in this lush estate. <laughs> it's and, and also in sitcoms. Yeah, it's absurd. Where like, oh yeah, I work part time at the university and I and I have this apartment which is cost three four, bedroom apartment in New York City. Yeah, and it's, square feet. it's like you know four hundred thousand dollars. Excuse me. Yeah. Um, that's just rent. No. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> so no, that that was. That was really glaring for me. Yeah. Outside that, it was a really good movie. Arrival was. Yeah, Arrival I was enjoyed Arrival a lot. It's, it's really- also, you know, it's like, well, in the future, uh, people <coughs> won't be uh, so broke and resource constrained. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, whatever. That's really quaint. So the movie we got to go see was one that I've been kind of itching to see. Uh, both excited and kind of nervous, nervous about it. Which is uh, the new Blade Runner. Blade, Blade Runner 2049. 20, yeah. 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 We should call the section Reading Watching. Reading Watching. Yeah. So we did a movie last week, didn't we? Did we? I thought we did. Oh, we talked about Doctor Strange. Yeah, That's right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but. Uh, Lots happened since last week. The kids destroyed that DVD, so we had to throw it away. <laughs> Goodness. It was really. Yeah, it was so stupid. But anyway. Anyway, we're going to. So. Uh, there will be possible spoilers. I'm not going to stop you from saying spoilers. I'm not going to try and say them, uh, utter any, uh, any any deep dark secrets. But you guys have had a few weeks to see it, for God's sake. Weeks to see it, and you you can skip ahead a little bit. Skip ahead if you if, if you don't want to hear spoilers. Blade Runner spoiled. Right, and I I don't know. I'm I'm not in the spoilers camp. I just don't care. Yeah, and I, I don't remember to not, to not tell people things. So right. I'm sorry. Well, you don't care if you get spoiled before you see. Something yeah, I don't, I don't care if you hear spoilers ever. Yeah. Or sometimes you'll be like, I'm not going to see it. Just tell me what happens. So what happens. Yeah, yeah. And actually, frequently that helps me decide whether or not to see it. Right. If it sounds cool, then you're like, oh, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to give you, I, I've got a lot to talk about in the next bit. So I'm going to give you, you know. Oh, Blade Runner. Okay. The um, There were a lot of things I liked about it, but I think I didn't like it. Like the first one? Like, Your overall one. assessment of it is that you did not like it. Yeah, but I, I liked a lot of things about it. Yeah, that's that's the thing about the first one. Blade Runner is inc- was incredibly influential, beautiful, stunning, dazzling. You know, amazing. It's actually not that good a movie. Right now, and I should let me let me qualify that with one thing. I think if I had been planning to see a horror film i think i would have liked it better i i was actually not expecting to see a horror film yeah and that's that's true of the first blade runner because it's kind of structured as a police procedural right and so i was expecting and the first blade runner was more of a police procedural than this was yeah it, yeah and that's not entirely fair there were it would it had those that structured framework of a police procedural yeah and you check in with your supervisor right, etc and it's, right. he's here on the patrol and, and that sort of progression that you're familiar with happens in the film in the new one in the new one yeah there there is uh, the the main character is solving a, a mystery a, a mystery a police a police mystery um what do they call that a cold case a or cold something. case yeah, yeah. well and in sort of like a the the larger framework is that 
it's his job. And if you don't know the framework for the Blade Runner stories, there are people who are Blade Runners, whose job it is to go and quote unquote retire replicants. And what they mean is to kill um, members of the slave labor force. Yeah. So yeah. that's what it means to retire a replicant. Um, so the Blade Runner's job is to go find them and kill them because they are errant in some way. Yeah. Oh, the the uh, the replicants originally called androids in the book, but not call, that word's not used so much in the in the movies. In the movies no. Are um, they are human form. Uh, they are stronger and faster and smarter in many cases than humans. They're created for different types of jobs. Different types of jobs and work. And the ones, the high end ones, are you know sh- much are faster in every, in every way. sharper, yeah. stronger in every way mm-hmm. than humans. Um, they are hard to distinguish from humans. The only way to distinguish, and this doesn't honestly, if you pick at this, it doesn't make any goddamn sense. So let's just accept it and move on. Mm-hmm. But the only way to distinguish them is with uh, something called a Voigt Kampf test, which Dick invented, which is a, a a measure of their ability to experience empathy. Oh right, right. Uh, to detect an emotional reaction when. Um, confronted with something that should produce a, a an emotional shock and feeling of empathy and horror. Right. They so, feel it or don't, and that's the right, difference. Right. Yeah, it's it's a little bit... It doesn't make any sense. But that's the idea. That's the idea. Um, and in the new film, they have something a little more... Um, or probably I should say a little less dicey, where they've got their, like, coded... They've got, like, a code number in their eyeball. To, that you can... Yeah, you you can shine a, a UV light on the lower part of the white of their eye or something and see this serial number printed, serial printed, printed on their, their eye. eye. Right. And then there's a they are in in the first few scenes when the guy retires his first uh, replicant, he actually takes the eye, collects the eyeball, yeah, in order to to prove to his boss that he did it. You got it right. So, uh, so yeah, so it is this police procedural in framework. Um, but the elements and the staging and the real, the real noir presence of it mm-hmm. evokes something really quite whole, you know, really from the heart of horror. Yeah. And I, yeah. I wasn't well, there for dystopia, that. it's dystopia. You know. Well, and, and it's dystopia. Yeah. And that's both films are dystopia. Right. Um, you know, where anyone with wealth has moved off the planet. Yeah. Because yeah. it's unlivable. Wealth and health. Anyone with wealth and health has left the planet. Yeah. So... Uh, it's a really dystopian backdrop. Um, yeah, no, the, just the, the deaths were very gruesome, and some of them were gratuitous. The yeah. violence towards women was just kind of pushed me over the edge, I yeah. think. Yeah, the, it was really... The, there was one in particular that really did not feel like it added anything to the story at all. And I think because it was so bizarre, detracted? It confused you, like, why am I watching why, this? Why, why did that happen? Why am I watching this? What's What's even going on? <sighs> Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, is it, and just specifically, it's a it's a murder scene where he the the a new villain replicant the, kills a new replicant uh, so who literally was just born, basically released from a plastic bag. And she stands up for the first time, and he just slices her open and leaves her to bleed out for no yeah, discernible it's, reason. It's he's, really weird. He's making a point about how upset he is that his replicants that he's trying to. To, to create a can't are imperfect in the sense that they can't have children they can't reproduce and so he slices open her belly and it's it's horrible it's real yeah and I think there were better ways for the movie to convey that this villain who's he's the the new Tyrell right. he's like the the guy who took over the assets of the Tyrell World corporation and then started re- producing replicants again, again that are right. Completely obedient. Yeah, but the um, there were other ways to convey that this guy was creepy AF, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, he he's really yeah he is he's really off the rails. He's he's a he's a bad bad guy. Yeah, but I mean you you know that even just the way he was lit and exposed in the film. Yeah, it's plenty of information. Yeah, and it's you don't really need to things, see him yeah. got a uh, you know vivisect and a, 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 a replicant, replicant you know in front of your it. face. 
it's really just i yeah. i guess he what I, I really can't make sense of that scene it feels gratuitous the only story element i think is that he did it in front of uh, love rep- he did it in front of another replicant to to put the fear of you know he sees himself as god he was putting the fear of god in her yeah um but she already the, she already was completely obedient she was already completely obedient and she was crying before he killed her <clears throat> she was standing behind him weeping before he killed her it was very strange it was a scene that just did not make yeah any sense so that took us out of it a little bit there were other scenes where characters died and since so many of the main characters in the film were women you know the, the women were going to be killed and one of them being princess buttercup yeah it was a great role for her actually yeah she was really good um she she is the the police uh the lieutenant the sergeant lieutenant, yeah. sergeant the overseer of the police the police um, uh, uh, the lapd yeah and she's she's she did a great job right. but her death scene was was a good death scene good i death mean scene. she was murdered by a replicant but she stood her ground and she was tough to the very going end. into it and yeah. you know and it, like even even in to the end, to the bitter yeah, end, she was tough. Right. Mm-hmm. It's like, do what you got to do. Yeah. And um, so you're actually proud of her for facing yeah. death so... So stoically. So stoically. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't... Uh, the camera deliberately did not linger on her bleeding out or whatnot or, or dying, you know. Right, no, no. I mean, it was definitely gruesome. They were trying to convey how horrifying the behavior of, of love, the replicant was is but it didn't have the gratuitous feel no it did not robin wright's the actress robin wright, she's not yeah. actually princess buttercup her name is robin oh wright. I, I know <laughs> but all the old fogies know her from the princess bride yeah it's like i'd like to see that on her driver's license I really oh, would. princess buttercup right That's here me. yeah and then she punches you in the face <laughs> <laughs> no, the last two times i've seen her in a film she's been really she badass. was in wonder woman yeah yeah, yeah. no she was she was the uh Oh, uh, Wonder Woman's coach, her uh, yeah, her lead trainer. So we went to see this film. Uh, we sort of missed an earlier showing by uh, just a hair. We couldn't get to it in yeah. time, uh, and so we went to a, a late night showing. This started at eleven twenty. Yeah, and, that and so of- we didn't get home till three a.m. almost. And yeah, it was very late. And uh, it's a long film. Yeah. It's like, what, two hours, 40 minutes, something like yeah. that. And that was my other thought, is that it, it, um, it had good story elements, but it, it was drawn out. There were several times I was checking my watch. It took too long yeah. to tell the story. Yeah. I really love movies that can stretch their legs, pace scenes, and build up tension, and build right. up things across scenes. But I think you're right. I think yeah. they easily could have shaved, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes. Uh, I'm... I'm gonna say they could have taken a half hour off. Really? I, yep. I there were some. I don't here's know the thing. I'm quite there, they but. had. Um, they were doing some world building. Yeah. And they had some really great spaces that evoked um, noir. Yeah. Mystery, horror. Yeah. Um, post-apocalyptic. Post-apocalyptic dystopian worlds. space, right? Yeah. Um, and they conveyed that really well. Yeah. They did a whole lot of lingering. I think trying to bring the point home. Where they did these wide span shop shots showing yeah. basically all of San Diego is wasteland as like a garbage dump, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they spent okay. a long time yeah. on that, and they did that over and over again. It could, that could have been trimmed. Honestly. That could have been trimmed. It's true because they staged the, it well. The, the, this like the fly-throughs of Las Vegas yeah, could have that, been shorter. That could have been a lot shorter. And even some of the, even that sequence where the character is lost in his memory of of uh as a boy Mm -hmm. uh, um which turns out to be an fake implanted memory but we Mm. won't um could have been a little could have been cut a little bit yes so a trim here you know five seconds of of slow pan here you know and also maybe as 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 little as 20 minutes but i think i think they could have cut as much as half an hour yeah, so I don't know. Will there be a director's cut that's shorter? That doesn't usually happen. No, it's usually It'll probably longer. be longer. <laughs> God help us. But I would, if I could recut it, I would, I would, I would either take out or drastically reshape that scene with the with the new replicant. Yeah, no, that was 
I don't know what that was for. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why it needs to be there. And even the fights, even the climactic fight scene in the in the air car it took at too the long. End, well, it took, it took much too, too long. long. Yeah. Yeah. I'm they not kept sure. cutting back to the same shots. Same shots again. And it just for no clear reason. It just needed to be a little tighter. Yeah. Yeah. So. And I think, I think the sequence of events yeah. was the right sequence of events. Yeah. But that each piece was just drug on. Yeah. So. The things I liked about it, yeah, um, I I loved the sets. They were amazing. The, sh- the, the cinematography was great. They tried to do in the in the previous movie. There were these scenes in the Tyrell building that were all filled with light coming through windows and shades and whatnot, and was done in this chiaroscuro, these washes of moving light. Mm-hmm. And is and of course in that movie, like people are smoking. Yeah. It was just total noir gorgeousness. Yeah. And they did a lot of that here. And too. they did a lot of that, although they took these sort of spaces and rendered them down to like their bare geometric emptiness. Right. You know, they were, it looked almost like to me they were shooting inside, and this was, I think, intentional in the original, mm-hmm. inside like um, uh, the Great Pyramid or something. Mm-hmm. You know, it was this huge like funerary architecture, you yeah. know, yeah. Uh, with, uh, with, uh, light coming in and the light was always moving in yeah. every shot the light's moving and as it moves it's like revealing the faces and shadows and whatnot and it's just i those were not those scenes were not too slow because i just love to to stare at to them. drink it in yeah. yeah well and they weren't they weren't wasting it either there was a character moving right you know behind, yeah, behind and you're, and you're revealing a character you're revealing a character in the process that you haven't seen yet uh, um I really liked the relationship they explored between his, the replicant's android. Yes, yes. I thought that was very good, very well done. I thought the dialogue was good. Yeah. Um, it was tight. It was very tight. And I thought I thought the acting was great. I, I was not prepared to... I was not prepared at all to like Ryan Gosling. To like Ryan Gosling in a role, but he, he, he was, was good. very restrained. His face, with the, thing, the things yeah. he did with his face, actually there very were restrained. Times he was all he was doing was breathing. Yeah. yeah, and like the way he was breathing was conveying a lot of information. Yeah. No, he, he was. <laughs> He was, I mean, to, uh, you're talking about a replica and say, well, he had a horrible life and was conveying that, well, life if, you know, he, right. he's had a horrible existence. He's yeah. killed people for the police, or pe- you know, whatever. That's all you, he does every day. And what he sees day to day is horrendous. Horrendous. And so he has this very convincing, nearly flat affect. Right. Where his life has just been drained of emotion. Right. But when he does see something or react to something that is a little glimmer of, of hope for him, mm-hmm. he really shows it in this subtle way. And then when that hope is ripped away or whatnot, it's just, it's horrible to look at. It's just yeah. like, it's just like they pull the plug and it all flows out. You right. Know? No, he, he does a great job. Yeah. The, the, actually, I think <clears throat> back, back to dialogue, the only time he conveys in dialogue precisely how grim his life is yeah is in the, one of the opening scenes the replicant he's been sent to kill offers him some food oh yeah and he says no, i i prefer to eat after the work day is done well yeah because he's about to vomit when he sees it blows the guy's head and apart blows the guy's head apart rips his eyeballs out but et, the, et but the farmer has has grown some garlic yes in this hellscape it's absolute hellscape he, he, where, where they're, everything they're raising is grubs for protein. They're raising grubs for protein indoors in this like radioactive, you know, tainted vent hood. Yeah, I mean it's a real hellscape. But he has like the verbs, you know. It's yeah, he, he used in whatever he was cooking. Who knows, sautéed grubs or what, boiled grubs or whatever. He had managed to throw in some real garlic and to grow in, yeah, and that was a garlic. beautiful scene. Gosling is like pulling the lid off the pan. And leaning over, and you know, you had this feeling like, oh, they're going to show what's in the pan. It's going to be something horrible. But they don't show what's in the pan. They just show him breathing in the Drinking scent. Drinking in the scent, right. And it's like, and he hasn't, clearly hasn't smelled garlic like, in a long time, but he knows what it is. Ever. Yeah. Oh, he, maybe he, it's yeah, ever. He, yeah, he doesn't know what it is. He says, like, he says, um, oh, yeah. Because he's asking where he farms. He says, I farm protein. Here's some of what I make. Yeah. Oh, here's some of what I grow. And Which are these, like, it's, vile little looks like something you dig out of your lawn honestly. yeah they're, they're grubs yeah. like yeah um and back and forth 
And he says, I grow a little garlic for myself. And he says, is that what that smell is? Yeah. Is oh, that's right. He didn't recognize didn't, it. He didn't know what the smell was, right? But he was fascinated by it. Right. Who and knew food could have flavor? Could have flavor of smells. So there's a similar moment um, when he meets a prostitute mm-hmm. and he's looking through um, uh, some photographs from the crime scene outside the farm. Outside, right. And uh, one of them is of this, this dead tree. Right. And the the pro- young prostitute girl is like, "What's that?" It's like, "It's a tree." She said, "Oh, I've never seen one before." It's pretty. And he, it's pretty. And he look kind of looks at her and with his totally deadpan affect says, "It's, it's dead. dead. It's dead. It's dead." <laughs> <laughs> there it is. So this this world, honestly, the world that they built for this film is even grimmer. Even gr- yeah. If, than, you, if you can imagine that, right? than the world of of Blade Runner. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, so I like the dialogue. I thought the acting was great. I thought the the sets and cinematography were great. Um, what else did I like? Oh, I I thought it was a good story. There are some elements to it's this to this movie that if you you know I'm a I'm a dickhead, a total dickhead. <laughs> like I know, uh, <laughs> I've read all of Phil Dick no, Phil Dick's novels except one and a half that are too bad to read or something yeah or just not good and studied his biography his autobiography his autobiographical writings his essays his stories his exegesis his theology all this stuff Uh, you know at length i was a total totally obsessed with his work and he has a very strange and dark personal history when he was born he was a twin he had a Mm -hmm. twin sister and their mother i think was disabled or mentally ill or depressed or not Something. she wasn't maybe severe postpartum depression who knows uh, yeah. honestly she was not taking care of them adequately and she was broke and poor and yeah. and um the kids were not thriving they weren't growing and somebody intervened like the state intervened um like cps was called or something right. and they took the kids and uh, and the the boy survived, and the sister, the twin, was so far gone that she died. And this thing was this was something that was significant and meaningful to Dick for the rest of his life. That his other half, literally his twin, mm-hmm. was, was had died. Right. And this yeah. worked its way into his theology, everything. And right. they. Um, they make reference to that in the film as part of the story. Right. But it's not like you're re- listening to this and you're like, oh my God, it's not like the characters that this happened to. This was Phil all, Dick. Phil Dick that this happened and to. And like, right. wow. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of moving, but also a little unnerving. It's a little unnerving. Yeah. Yeah. But so. no, a, a, good, a good story. A story worth telling. Yeah, okay. So, yeah, uh, it's worth seeing. It is absolutely not for young people. Yeah, don't don't bring your kids to this film. I wouldn't even nope. go if you're under 21, honestly. Yeah, yeah. At least. Um, <laughs> I, I'm serious. I'm not being funny. No, it's just really dark. It's, it's really nihilistic. Dark. It's. I don't recommend it. It's philosophically it very dark. Yeah. Um, and there's also a, there's a scene of a drowning in it. Oh. And I have a trouble with those scenes. I have this, like in se- there's several movies I've seen that have drowning scenes in them that I just yeah. I don't want to watch. Yeah, you know, it's very difficult. So, but it is and now, and even I, I have to say though, mm-hmm. um, a lot of the horror in the film you're not prepared for. Yeah, like it just happens, and you're just kind of you're trapped there in the scene. Um, they do prepare you for the drowning scene. Oh yeah, we're, we're, they're working up to this they're fight the in the water yeah. for a right. long time, and. Right. And you're kind of hoping they manage to kill her, although you don't really want to watch her drown. No, yeah, it's awful. Ugh. Yeah. Anyway, um, so good movie, very very dark film. Yeah. I do want to see it again in the theater if I can, just to try and pick up more detail. Yeah, I'm not going. It, you don't have to go. Um, but yeah, as as a total dickhead, I've got, I feel like I need to. Yeah, commitment to, to yeah. Yeah. Okay. Have a commitment to honor. So. Understandable. So yeah, definitely not for everyone. Very long, very violent, uh, dark, very dark. Mm-hmm. Um, if you liked the original, you'll 
probably like you'll this probably like quite this. a bit, and you'll yeah. recognize a lot of callbacks and references. Yes. And it's like all the coolest elements of the original blown up bigger than life yeah. even. Yeah. And I will say of the soundtrack, um, it is... This is a slight criticism. It is an om- an homage to Vangelis's original score. It borrows a lot of elements from the original score, mm-hmm. but it doesn't take a lot of risks. Oh, it doesn't try anything new. It doesn't really try anything innovative with the soundtrack in this sort of visual space that you're in. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's convincing, but it's not like stunning. Right. Whereas like with Arrival, the things they were doing with the soundtrack were quite radical for a science yeah. fiction movie. Very impressive. With these bare little choruses and choirs and, and murmurs and and nature sounds and all that that were beautiful. beautiful. Just beautiful. And convincing. Yeah. I, so, I bought it. Yeah. So uh, Blade Runner, the original score to me is one of the best scores I've ever seen. I've ever heard. in any I've heard in any film. Right. This one is not going to be. It's not like that now. I'm probably not going to buy the soundtrack, but it is very, very evocative of the original. Yeah. Oh, and I have one last note on Blade Runner. So Harrison Ford and Sean Young both reappear in this film. Yeah. Harrison Ford was allowed to age 30 years. Sean Young was not. Yeah. Make of that what you will. Uh, that is something that I think definitely they should be called out on. Um, she Somehow she gave them permission to use her likeness, and she is used. She is listed in the credits. Yeah. But she it's not her. It's, it's not her. Yeah. It's not 2016 Sean Young. No. It, it's a likeness of Sean Young from the early, mid-80s. Yeah, and... I, having seen the original movie so many times, I personally did not find her reconstructed uh, face to be entirely convincing. No. Now, mind you, I think they um, they use the context of her appearance to uh, hang a lampshade on that. Yes, yes. That she's, she's supposed to be unnerving. She doesn't convince Harrison Ford she either. She doesn't convince Harrison Ford either. Right. And she's supposed to be unnerving, and she's supposed to be close but not quite. Which really doesn't make any sense, because as a replicant, she could be an exact genetic match, yes. born in exactly the same way. You know? Yeah. Like, same but epigenetics. But their contention and, is, yeah. their contention in the story is that Rachel was... Was special. Was special and unique. Yeah. Because she was able to reproduce, yeah, and they can't, re- they can't, they cannot do that replicate that. They cannot she, replicate that. They keep her. referring to it as a miracle. Yes, there, I should say that there's a line of theological uh, thinking underlying many of these scenes and yeah. of the dialogue. It almost is literally you almost hear one in being with the father begotten, not made, you know, you hear, it's almost there, right? You hear like practically a catechism of, of the father, son right. and Holy spirit. You right. know, it's anyway. Mm-hmm. Okay. We're going to move on from Blade on. Runner. Yeah. But, but yeah, it's, I think if you're up for it, it's worth seeing. Yep. Okay. So we've been, um, we've been talking about books we're reading and did you get anything finished? You want to mention? I, I, no, I can't finish anything. Can't finish. Yeah, well, I'm not finished with anything. I, I can. I'm just not. I'm not finished with this book, but I'm ready to talk about it a bit. Do it. So this book is... Um, the Warren, Warren thing? The Warren Commission Report. No. no. <laughs> oh, different wait. Warren. Different, different Warren. Warren. Different, oh, mayday, different decade. Mayday. <laughs> different decade. Uh, this is A Fighting Chance by Elizabeth Warren. This is a recent printing because it says it has uh, a new afterword. And I'm not done with it, but I'm about half about halfway. Right. And so I, I do have a few comments. Um, basically, I'm reading this to try and understand what she's about and what her ambitions are and what I can support and what I can't uh, in her sort of politics. Mm-hmm. And um, you're every time I think I've become cynical, you always defeat me. <laughs> Because they're like, I'm like, I, I give what I think is a cynical take, and you like look down your nose and like, like, please. teabagger, please. <laughs> <laughs> that yeah. ain't no preacher. That ain't no preacher. So, uh, I will say some positive things about it, but I'd like to hear your take, even though I know you haven't read her book per se. But right, okay. 
Um, so I will say that it is an engrossing story, a personal story. It moves along well. It's very well edited. Like she gets through her full, all her formative years and uh, and up to her first teaching job in the first chapter. Or so so mm-hmm. it, it zips along. Um, it is also there is a sense that it is very carefully uh, pared down, vetted, and crafted. Um, she worked on it uh, with I think uh, was it her mom? I, no, I, I not her know. mom, but um, mother-in-law, daughter-in-law. Maybe I've heard of her working with a, a relative. I think it was her daughter-in-law. Well, it's it's very crafted, and mm-hmm. one of the ways you realize that it's very crafted is when she actually starts to go sort of into the weeds of her history and politics and mm-hmm. the things she's working on is just like clockwork. I, I don't, I'm not, I haven't measured it by word or page, mm-hmm. but every few pages when it seems like maybe you're likely to, to start nodding off or for your eyes to roll back in your head because she's talking about, you know, mortgage, uh, you know, um, mortgage deductions. Yeah. Mortgage dedu- or, or um, CDOs, you know, mm-hmm. uh, she drops in a homey, uh, self-deprecating, personal, funny, personal touching, anecdote. personal anecdotes. It's either about about her family, about herself. It's always you self-deprecating. It's always she sometimes talks about her dog, yeah. you know. And it it just is happening so regularly, such on a like tick of the the page count that you just feel like, oh, these were re-engage me. <laughs> these were like grafted in some you know someone went through the text with her and it's like okay we need another we need a a break Something we need a break we need a break mm-hmm. and um they're not bad um it is very convincing like it's yeah. seductive in a way that you are really you feel a lot of personal uh empathy and connection empathy and connection to her and she, it's she doesn't even she's not bragging Mm -hmm. she doesn't it's not even a humble brag the thing she's talking Mm -hmm. about she's like this i mean one of the stories that that convinces you of her humanness is that a time when she went on john stewart and was so nervous uh before they called her onto the set that she was throwing up in the you know in Mm -hmm. the uh, green room or whatnot right right and you're like oh you know like that's probably what would happen to me. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so it's very easy to fall into. Oh, yeah. I said I had terrible gas before I had to give my talk. <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> it awful. Hey, yeah, stop on. trying to steal Elizabeth's <laughs> oh, thunder here. <laughs> oh, as yeah, it just sorry. plain folks. Oh, yeah. Just a regular, just a regular old grace. Carry on. Uh, yeah. Um, but, uh, but she, so it's, it's, it feels like you're being drawn in a right. bit, yeah, at yeah. least to me. Mm-hmm. And I feel slightly suspicious of it. Right. But, um, you know, I, I, I also believe it's largely true. And she has, um, I'm trying to read my notes and my eyes aren't that good. My eyes aren't that good. So hang on, I'm going to pick it up. Um, yeah. To interrupt the wonky economic talk, which is not really that wonky and not really that in need of interruption, at least not for me. But that's because I've read about I've read about this stuff yeah. at yeah. length. Um, so parts of it are very affecting. I'm going to read a couple clips here. This is from page 35 of the the trade paperback. Um, I even put little bookmarks in it. You're getting good, bro. Yeah. So. Um, The number of bankrupt families was climbing. In the early 1980s, when my partners and I first started collecting data, the number of families annually filing for bankruptcy topped a quarter of a million. True, a recession had hobbled the nation's economy and squeezed a lot of families. But as the 1980s wore on and the economy recovered, the number of bankruptcies unexpectedly doubled. Suddenly, there was a lot of talk about how Americans had lost their sense of right and wrong, Hmm. how people were buying piles of stuff they didn't actually need and then running away when the bills came due. Banks complained loudly about unpaid credit card bills. The word deadbeat got tossed around a lot. Yeah. It seemed that people filing for bankruptcy weren't just financial failures. failures. They had also committed an unforgivable sin. Moral failures. Part of me still wanted to buy the deadbeat story because it was so comforting, but somewhere along the way, while collecting all those bits of data, I came to know who these people were. In one of our studies, we asked the people to explain in their own words why they filed for bankruptcy. I figured that most of them would probably tell stories that made them look good or that revealed them of guilt. 
I still remember sitting down with the first stack of questionnaires. As I started reading, I'm sure I wore my most jaded, squinty-eyed expression. The comments hit me like a physical blow. They were filled with Mm self-loathing. One man had written just three words to explain why he was in bankruptcy. Stupid. 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 When people, with, when writing about their lives, people blame themselves for taking about, out a mortgage they didn't understand. They blame themselves for their fail to, failure to realize their jobs weren't secure. They blame themselves for their misplaced trust in no good husbands and cheating wives. It was blindingly obvious to me that most people saw bankruptcy as a profound personal failure, a sign that they were losers through and through. Some of the stories were detailed and sad, describing the death of a child or what it meant to be laid off after 33 years with the same company. Others stripped a world of pain down to their bare facts. Wife died of cancer, left $65,000 in medical bills after insurance. Lack of full-time work, worked five part-time jobs to meet rent, utilities, phone, food, and insurance. They thought they were safe, safe in their jobs and their lives and their love, but they weren't. I ran my fingers over one of the papers, thinking about a woman who had tried to explain how her life had become such a disaster. A turn here, a turn there, and her life might have been very different. Mm. Divorce, an unhappy second marriage, a serious illness, no job. A turn here, a turn there, and my life might have been very different, too. Mm -hmm. So you really feel compassion for this, and you feel like she... They set it up from from the beginning of her story. Her family was right. very impoverished and mm-hmm. barely held it together, you know. Right. And so you believe that she's committed to the bankruptcy issue in particular because she empathizes strongly with the people this is happening to. Right. And yeah. and doesn't regard it as a, as a con job. Right. So I, I like that. That was moving. Um, there's a bit where she talks about. Um, the situation in Washington and on her, uh, when she set herself up in Washington as part of this oversight panel Mm -hmm. uh, called COP cop. Hmm. um, Take that. She had uh, Republican uh, colleagues and she didn't know what was what, as far as what they were going to expect and demand. Right. right. And so, uh, Hen Sarling's office was already open for business. This is page 98. The congressman came out quickly to greet us. Handshakes all around, and Michael and I joined Hen Sarling and one of his staffers in his private office. I perched on the edge of a sofa with my coat across my lap. After Hen Sarling's dissent on the first report, I hoped I would find out what he wanted to do differently. Maybe he had strong views about what we should investigate. Maybe he had an idea for how we could monitor where the TARP money went. This was the whole... Oh, the TARP thing, yeah, yeah. They were supposed to be monitoring TARP. The only regulatory authority they had to actually do anything, though, is they were supposed to write reports. That's it. Oh, no teeth. No teeth. And um, also... Not even fingernails. As soon as they started writing them, various people appointed to the committee started refusing to sign off on them. So they were only signed by like the Democrats <laughs> Hen Sarling was a Republican. Uh, you think Ken Starling or Hen Sarling? Hen Sarling. Okay. H E N S A R L I N G. So she yeah. does name names. Congressman Hen Sarling. Okay. All right. So blah, blah, blah. Um, after giving me a big smile, Hen Sarling dived right in. He said something along the lines I want to know your plans for dividing up the budget. This organization had just come into existence. Right. And it was her and a handful of other people trying, and they had been cranking to try and get the first reports out. Right. Just like working around the clock. Mm-hmm. And she didn't have any plan for how to hire more, I mean, yet have any plan for how to hire more people. And so she, her writing says, dividing our budget. The congressman explained that he wanted to know what portion of COP funding I planned to allocate to the Republicans and what portion I planned to keep for the Democrats. It's supposed to be a nonpartisan committee, right? A bipartisan committee. Bipartisan. Commission. Mm-hmm. I remind him that we were all working on the same 
investigations and the same reports. Congress hadn't specified the exact budget, but they were willing to give us funds we needed to get the work done. And that's what we'd do. I told him that I felt strongly about one thing. There's no money for one side versus the other. This shouldn't be a my party, your party exercise. We should work together with one nonpartisan staff. In other words, she wanted the staff to be nonpartisan appointments, like oh, right. like researchers, secretaries, you know. Mm-hmm. Except all those people are partisans, though. <clears throat> well, that's... There's that. In Washington, you're a partisan. Yeah, yeah full stop. It's just that's how it is. The congressman took a few more passes at his point. Sure, he understood that we were working together. That was all very nice. But I obviously yeah. didn't know the ways of Washington. He chuckled and smiled, but he kept coming back to the same point. What part of the budget would the Democrats get to control, and what part would go to the Republicans? After a few more rounds, his tone got hard. Look, he said, the game is shirts and skins. <laughs> really? Okay, well, she's like, I, she did not immediately take her shirt off, right? right? A vivid image immediately shot into my brain. Boys with sharp elbows playing pickup basketball, everyone hogging the ball, one team in shirts, and the other bare skinned. Uh, no girls on either team, of course, right? And Sarling's point was obvious. He wanted to make sure his team got its share. Mm-hmm. So that's another moment where you're like, you know, it's basically, this is my, her education, you right, know? Right. And, you're, and you're kind of cheering for her. And you're kind of cheering for her, and you're pretty, it seems pretty convincing. Right. Um, then there's another line, there's another moment that's a pretty, I think a pretty powerful moment. She talks about this, and this was actually, I think, uh, she's referred to this in interviews. In early April, I got a call from the office of Larry Summers. I didn't know Larry well, but I'd met him a few times when he was president of Harvard Harvard in the early 2000s. According to reports, Larry had been Tim Geithner's mentor when they were both in the Treasury Department in the 1990s. Now Larry was the director of the National Economic Council, which meant that, along with Secretary Geithner, Mm -hmm. he advised President Obama on economic issues. Would I be interested in meeting for dinner? Sure, I replied. Larry's office suggested the Bombay Club, an Indian restaurant near the White House. I believe I've been there, actually. Yeah. Quiet and softly lit, it served Washington's power elite. When Larry arrived for our dinner, he ordered a Diet Coke as soon as he sat down. He glanced at the menu, ordered quickly, and soon the food started coming. It was a long dinner, with plenty of intense back and forth about everything from the bailout to deregulation to the foreclosure crisis. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Later in the evening, Larry leaned back in his chair and offered me some advice. Uh, Larry's tone was in the friendly advice category. He teed it up this way. I had a choice. I could be an insider or I could be an outsider. It's your call. Outsiders can say whatever they want, but people on the inside don't listen to them. Mm -hmm. Insiders, however, get lots of access and a chance to push their ideas. People... Powerful people listen to what they have to say, but insiders also understand one unbreakable rule. They don't criticize other insiders. Mm. I had been warned. There you go. And I, like I said, I've heard her describe this in interviews as well, and I, I think it's important, and I think it, it actually says a lot about how anyone in office yeah. is at the level of Congress or Senate right, you know, how they got there. Uh, a representative or Senator or whatnot, mm-hmm. or even appointees right. um, can't speak candidly right? and do not. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's not like you don't know this already or suspect it, but this is a pretty, it's pretty clear. Here it is right on your fork. Mm-hmm. So, so I thought that was a neat moment. Um, one more quick point here. Uh, this is like page 180. We're fairly far along now. And this is relevant to our season too. Here. Okay. I love Halloween. Mm. Dressing up, trick-or-treating, handing candy out at the door. Confession. I have a real weakness for mounds. Like, mm. that's actually my favorite candy bar if I'm eating commercials, you know. Candy? Mounds? Ma- mass-produced. Mounds or Almond Joy. But yeah. Either okay. one. All right, I thought it was Almond Joy. That's right. Almond Joy, I'm yeah. Confused. But the, the, they're both, they're like uh, different versions of the same thing. Almond Joy has nuts. Mounds, Mounds don't. don't. 
because sometimes you feel feel like like a nut. nut. Sometimes Sometimes you you don't. don't. Oh, my God. That just happened to you. (sighs) Sorry. So sorry. So, so (laughs) sorry. One year, Lavinia talked me into becoming the Sparkle Queen, complete with a pink glitter wig. Also, that I would compliment her Sparkle Princess costume. Fortunately, I believe all the relevant photos from that Halloween have been deleted. Oh. I would have loved to see that in the photo section, that, honestly. That need to be in the photo yeah. sections. See, see, that's where she lost me right there, but go on. I've also been a lost sheep for her little Bo Peep. This year, we dressed up as a rose, Lavinia, Cleopatra, Octavia, a pumpkin, tiny baby brother, the Mad Hatter, Bruce, and Robin Hood. Me, and then, this is in parentheses, me, Tongue firmly in, in cheek. cheek. <laughs> and I like, did you think you needed to explain and call out to us just to make sure we understood that you weren't really Robin, Robin Hood? Hood? You weren't really like actually planning on robbing from the rich to, to give to, to the, the poor, poor, right? You right? weren't going to go there. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute. Her tongue was firmly in her cheek. cheek. Yeah. And that line wasn't written to me. No. It that was, was written to the columnists at the Wall Street Journal who are going to review this book and comment on it. Yeah. So that she could diffuse them saying, oh, Pocahontas with her... With her Robin Hood fantasies. With her Robin Hood fantasies. And they, they even got her like... Um, there was an incident where after she moved into her office, someone came around... At Treasury, someone came around with a book of paint chips and was like, Would you, so uh, we're doing re- routine like repainting of offices because they're, you know, haven't been painted in 10 years or right, whatever. Right. Uh, would you like to pick a color? And she picked a color and someone on the staff leaked to the press that Warren had immediately after moving in had had her office uh, repainted Lord. at great expense. And, and uh, she chose like a southwestern terracotta theme. Again, they were playing on the Pocahontas, oh, like, oh, yeah, because she's an Indian, right? She's yeah. a Native American, yeah, yeah. thing. Yeah. And, and, like, seriously? Yeah, seriously. And this was another lesson. She actually got a public apology for that right. uh, from her boss. Is like, this was this didn't need to be a news item. It doesn't need to be a news item. It doesn't need to be a thing. Uh, but here we are. But here we are. So... But that little aside, like, note, tongue firmly in cheek, and like, that doesn't, that's not written for me. No. And so that that's like, yeah, this is where, like, the mask slips just a little bit, and you see the, the robotic, like, replicant uh, gears and wheels behind it, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, Here's a progress. Progress right here. Anyway, so I, I remain... Um, She's. I, I like what she's done and what the causes she's championed mm-hmm. and all this, but I remain suspicious because I, she doesn't actually seem to be on the left on most issues in most ways. And she's. I, th- I think she kind of wants to be an insider-outsider. Yeah. Some people like that idea. And I'm it not, that way. and so yeah, like that, that, yeah. that is the crux, I believe. Again, I haven't finished the book, but I believe that's the crux of why she doesn't think she can run for office. But she's now a senator. Yep. And that's pretty firmly inside the tent. That's inside, yeah. And so, uh, but, but it's not, the thing is, it's not just her. Yeah. This issue of like, who's the politician that, that I feel like I can support that's going to champion these economically left policies right. and I and ideas and policies that are designed for people like me who just are working to live, you right. know? Who is that person? That, who is person, that person? There's no one there. There's no one there. No. And w- her take on certain issues and her work on certain issues has been valuable and high profile. Mm-hmm. Um, and I respect it. But she can't be a real, a, a real, she can't push for real reform. Real change. She can't criticize capitalism. Nope. She can't criticize the existing institutions. Nope. Like they need criticizing. Yeah. <clears throat> All she can do is say, 
we're gonna we're gonna change the regulatory regime. We're gonna tinker around the edges, and yeah, just and I can't. Lines. That's not really enough for me to jump up and down Woo-hoo. to want to support her as a politician. No, yeah. so. she's arranging. Yeah, that's arranging deck chairs. So, and, and you know, maybe you're really into the deck chairs. I don't know, but <coughs> the sinking ship, <coughs> the sinking ship is my concern. Yeah, yeah. So. so yeah. Any thoughts on my take so far? No, I, I appreciate your skepticism. I I, I, I look to you as a model of, of uh, cynicism and skepticism. <laughs> I, I don't know whether to be flattered or terrified. Um, <clears throat> I probably would not have read her book. I think she needed to stay in academia and that she was more valuable to all of us. Uh, in academia? In academia. Well, I, she really has, uh, I think, done valuable work in uh, actually in bringing up a generation of uh, people into economics and bankruptcy law and financial oversight and whatnot who are more radical than she is. Well, and that's and they can be. They can be. And I don't know. I I feel like if she wanted to serve the American people, yeah. that would have been a better service to the American people. Yeah. I don't. I don't know that she's. Of service to the American people in the Senate, I mean, really, I think she does a really great job of giving the Democrats cover. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. that's a little bit what I'm kind of scratching my head over. Yeah, that she really gives the Democrats cover, but I, but other than that, and and they and she serves at their pleasure. Right. Right. So I'm not so sure she can take her position in the Senate anywhere. And. We talk about, you know, this is really, this book is really just a, like an opening salvo in a, a presidential yeah. campaign. I don't, yeah. I don't actually quite buy that. I mean, I guess it could happen, but I don't you believe, keep your open, you know? I don't believe the Democratic Party, the DNC, as it's constituted now, will, uh, uh, will run her. I, I don't oh, believe. You know, it could be a Hail Betty pass, you know? <sighs> I guess. Yeah, they I, could I just, try it. They could go for I it. I don't, but I, I don't think they will because. That's because stupid. the the the, the bank lobby has spent so much uh, against her, yeah. and they have fought her tooth and nail, and they've basically made it so that she couldn't run the Consumer Protection right. uh, Bureau. You know, right. I forget the acronym. the COP. Well, no, this is a, a, a oh, different, different a different yeah. the 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 new Bureau for Financial Products. For pro- oh, yeah. <clears throat> well, I. I think there's there's no harm in writing the book and not running, but you can't run unless you've written the book. That that's true. I think that's true. So, you that know, this is you keep your options open. You do what you got to do. Because she's certainly um, the book really does portray her in a a, a very convincing light, mm-hmm. and it's only if you come to it with a strong preconceived notions about what you're looking for in a, in a politician that you would have a lot to. To argue, to argue with, with. Or, or to not be, or if, or if you were, you know, say, say you, you worked for Citibank, you're sure you'd pick it, you'd be picking it apart from like, the other. But wait a minute, that's from the other me. side. Yeah, right. Hey, wait a minute, that's gonna be a thing. For yeah, my it's yacht, like, you know? well, you know, um, the insurance industry employs a lot of low-income women who hate to see anything happen, happen to, to them. them. Yeah, just saying. Yeah, so I'll finish the book. It's not in. It's. it's Bits of it are actually inspiring. Yeah. You know, but All it's inspired they're inspiring me about certain issues, not right. about her as a leader. Oh, yeah, yeah. Per se. Mm-hmm. But so that's where it is. Anyway. Well, that's a good one. Okay. So. I mean, you know, you know I, I I think Oops. if you Sorry. I, I'm I'm not a democrat. I never have been. And so it's a little bit like why, why do I even have anything to say about the democrats? Yeah. You know? I, yeah. Um, because they're part of the story, I guess. They're part of the story. They're important, you know. <clears throat> In a way. Um, rapidly but, but becoming if, less important. Rapidly becoming less important. But if, you, if you're if you into uh, democratic politics, I think it's a worth read. It's, it sounds like it's worth reading. Oh, I had one, one more really quick note about Warren herself. Mm. Do you remember um, when, you, you do, I know, when Star Trek Voyager launched? Yeah. Do you remember how uh, when Captain Janeway showed up on the ship, mm-hmm. they were very deliberately setting out to make her like not just a Picard with a vagina, yeah, right? Uh, that she was a different person because mm-hmm. and to make her 
different because she was a woman and she brought something different. She brought something different. And this was, at the time, I remember kind of giggling at it because she introduced herself. She met the, the crew members one by one. And she asked them all, so she's like, how are you, you know, and how's your family? Yes. Right, do you remember that? Yes, I do. She specifically talked to them about her family, and then she knew details about their families. Right, right? their lives. You know, and even one of them is like, oh, you, and we just spoke earlier, I know your family's, you know, as well well and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, come on. This is Starfleet is a military operation, right? They're, They're launching this new ship, you know. Are we? Is that really what a woman brings to the table? That's different. I mean, maybe mm. so, but mm. why? Why is that in the the launch scene where they're basically doing their, you know, sh- their very uh, like white knuckle uh, rundown of the checklist to like pull this ship out of dry dock for the first time? In fairness, Star Trek does a lot of that. Though. Well, yeah, but but carry on. But basically, is, is here's a deliberate uh, role for a woman that's different, where she's her portrayal of a starship captain is very different than Picard. And we're going to make that, we're going to we're going to prop that up and lampshade and it and gender it, yeah, gender it, yeah. Right. And um, as I was reading this, I couldn't help but think that she was making herself a little bit Captain Janeway with all these homey anecdotes, oh. because deep down, it's. It makes me, it humanizes her, and I like the fact that she has a little humility about telling mm-hmm. stories about herself and all this. But it's not important. Yeah, no, it's, it's, just, it's a side issue. Why are you doing this? I wanted to hear more about the people in bankruptcy. You know, yeah. I want to hear more about more of their stories, more about the vulnerable, more about the weak, and you know, anyone uh, marginalized, really, anyone marginalized, anyone who's been screwed over by banks and you know been mm-hmm. damaged in the mortgage crisis. And all. I want to hear more about them. I didn't want to hear her comforting people and chatting Our about Halloween their families yeah. yeah so i don't know so that's my that's my final yeah it seemed like a a gendered tack on a gendered tack on that's yeah a tacky on fashion <laughs> <laughs> all right so so onward we're, we're taking forever to get really through are. our topics i'm Cause sorry I'm sleep i think that's it we we got uh way too little sleep last night mm-hmm. and uh, cuz we had to drink um caffeine to stay, to, up for the movie. to stay up for the movie and even so uh because we were there so late i think it led when you're up at 3 a.m. or 2 a.m. and you're not used to it yeah. especially at our age yeah. <laughs> you're kind of in a hypnotic state right uh, you're, I think you're a little bit suggestible. You're in a little bit of a trance almost. Mm-hmm. And in that regard, like the movie could kind of pour directly into your head without you being able to like clamp, like clamp shut, shut the gate when it was like, whoa, whoa, oh, hey. Whoa, right here, right in my subconscious. Yeah. That's and, not cool. And so it it we were, it was disturbing. Yeah. Yeah. Really disturbing. Anyway. But no, next segment, walk a week, make it quick. We went to Mathai Botanical Gardens. Walk of the Week. We yeah. have a s- segment we're going to call Walk of the Week, and I'm going to insert some appropriate music walking right my here. Baby, talking my baby, loving my baby. I don't mean maybe walking my baby back home. Okay. <laughs> Is that professional? I thought that was very professional. Thank you. Mathai Botanical Gardens. It was beautiful. They have lots of really well-groomed gardens, and the trail is very walkable. Yeah, um, they're clearly updating a lot of their trail bridges through the marshland. We we got partway through a loop that we thought was going to lead us back to the parking lot. Back of the car, in five and minutes. the trail was closed, yeah. and it hadn't been marked like when you go in on no. the map or anything. No. And we're like, oh, so now right. we have to backtrack. And walk all the way around another And walk minutes. all the way around another 50 minutes. And the kids were losing it and losing getting tired. It. So yeah. this is the real challenge is we're trying to push the kids so that they get a good workout. But end it before they melt down. But end it before they melt down and we have to carry more than two of them all the way back to the car, you know. 
So it's hard. Yeah, it's so a little it's hard. hard. But it was a beautiful, warm it's Absolutely, Sunday. absolutely beautiful. Sun is low in the sky, slanting through the leaves, and the air was gorgeous. warm and still, and it's mm-hmm. just, it's we're gorgeous. along a little stream, and mm-hmm. it's just a gorgeous walk. And the kids also really enjoy the kids' garden the children's area. Garden. Yes. Yeah. That was, that was very well crafted. I was very impressed. There's like a little playground out of where you can build structures out of logs and timber sticks. and sticks and... <laughs> and Mary was losing it. It was like it was like he was in a candy store. Oh, sticks! Yeah, so sticks. Fun. You see the leaves? <laughs> well, there's like a little lean-to uh, built on against a stump, and he's crawling into it. And he's like, "Look, I'm little. I can fit right in this it's little so house." Cool. Like, yay! It, <laughs> oh, it was marvelous. It's really delightful to see, uh, to to feel their joy at seeing these kinds of things like for yes. the first time and you're yes. like because we're so fucking jaded so. yeah that's no, really it's embarrassing how cynical and jaded i am yeah but no mary going through the maze and there's the little a little house. there's a little, a little tiny hedge maze <laughs> yeah and it's like it's not you know i wouldn't call it a challenging maze but no. mary's running around it's like whoa i'm lost i can't, I'm lost. I can't go this way ah. <laughs> and sam sam's already oh, jaded. It's, it, i can the way see out's you right here come right, on you just walk out yeah you can step over the <laughs> you can step over that hedge <laughs> but mary was having a blast having a blast and so was pippin yeah. and so was joshua yeah. and sam had a good time too Despite his best efforts at being all, no, this is stupid. This is stupid. And cool. Yeah. <laughs> so, Mathai, that was our walk, and uh, we'll probably go back there. Yeah, I think we'll go back there. Yeah. Okay. So, we have, this is probably a disaster. Train wreck. In the making. Yeah. Why don't we just talk about the our third topic? That one, just that one? Yeah. Should we have for that? Well, let's do the other two quick. Real quick. Okay. Um, I'm going to say one thing. Yeah. George W. Bush is a war criminal. Yeah. Don't forget that. Yeah. So this the first topic is is uh, there, there's been several editorials posted and people sharing memes and articles and speeches because because Bush made a speech in which yeah. he indirectly criticized Trump. For being if you a read his whole speech, it's not exactly a, a bomb throwing you know liberal propaganda no. piece no. it's just a uh, basically a plea to uh to uh return to something re- more resembling like conservative norms you know that's really yeah. all he said yeah <clears throat> which and people are just lapping that up as if he's not a war criminal yeah uh, can we re- can we return to like you know and so the, the editorials are <laughs> yeah the editorials like, are like Oh, he's so presidential. And then it's, it's the same thing with like, you know, Miss Me Yet, the Miss Me Yet billboards and the yeah. like, you know, don't we wish he was president instead of Trump? Like, no, 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 no I don't. because his administration was dangerous enough to get a lot of murder done on an enormous scale and lead the whole U.S. into the international crime of aggression. And, and well, no, and be the opening salvo. For a complete erosion of uh, civil liberties, civil liberties so, yeah, and yeah. and all the all the uh, fallout and all the consequences of this thing, and we are st- we still We're there still are prisoners out. in Guantanamo who have been there for uh, sixteen, 16 years, years, a long time, and still awaiting tr- <laughs> and still not charged, still awaiting trial, yeah. and they really can't get a trial because they were tortured. Yeah. Uh, little details like that. Yeah. Um, it's his 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 eight years were a complete clusterfuck. We yeah. need to stop. We, and people are no, saying, "Didn't you feel less stressed out under the Bush administration?" And I'm like, "No, no." But here here's here's what here's my take. Okay, it comes down to people do feel less stressed out when they think that their team is in charge and they go to sleep. Oh yeah, and yeah, yeah. then they're like, "Oh, everything's no. in good hands." I can just, you know, I can stop paying attention to politics. Just sail on, and their stress level goes down. Right. But if you really become woke, so to speak, about politics, maybe it's woke AF, man. That's you right. don't go back. You don't go back, and you're never off. I don't, and you're never off, and that's that's actually a, a unpleasant. It's an unpleasant yeah. thing to live in, but like. You know, I did vote for Obama once, but I did not feel that 
if you really follow what's going on international relations and the war effort and all this and the all the and the drones and strikes and the war crimes and all this you can't relax you can't be relaxed about this no no you can't like fold up and stop you know just abandon the anti-war movement no. because your guys in office and so no it's i i do not feel worse with trump in office than i did with bush in office Having Bush in office felt bad. Yeah. Having Obama in office felt bad. There was like this moment of hope, but then it was like, this feels bad. Yep. And Trump also feels bad, but if you look at what he's doing rather than just his tactless, you know, antics, his, his, ta- his tactless antics, which are mostly distractions, yeah. um, he's not getting much done. No, it's not. And it's the people like like President Cheney, with yes. Bush as his as his cover mm-hmm. story, that were came in to office ready to implement a very brutal and nasty and absolutely cynical agenda. Yeah. Uh, well, so yeah, no, the the for Halliburton for you know for, Carlisle for, like, Group for grifting to grift. Yeah, yeah. Just an absolute kleptocracy. Yeah, and. 45 is not any different. It's not any different. Not any different in that respect. The um, But he can't get any of his signature achievements through, honestly. Yeah. No, not really. Well, you know, time will tell. We'll take a look and see in a few months, see what happens. And so he's like, I'm, you know, you can be so disgusted about how he's talking about the, the, the dead soldiers. Yeah. But this is actually a cover for not looking too closely at why these people were in. Why they were there why, at all. Why they were there, why Chad is not there, and, you know, why we're... So there's a lot to unpack if you dig into that. If you dig into it at all, there's a lot to unpack. And I think this idea that people change or that maybe, you know, he wasn't so bad after all, or, you know, I don't know that he was evil or any of that. He needs to be in prison. He needs to be in prison. He needs and, to be in, full stop. You know, if he he's a Hague fugitive. If for he God's serves sake. his his if he serves, I don't know, decade at least for war crimes and comes out and wants to be a ambassador for peace or something. And, I'm into that. Then serve th- your time. Then we'll and talk. come back and you know, we'll reintegrate you to society. Then we'll talk. But you don't get to just you know. Now he paints puppies and wounded soldiers. And uh, oh, so there, I did get a good question that I, I haven't responded to online. Um, yeah, because your feed is all up. People, all these uh, liberals up in their up in your grill, up in my grill trying about. to rehabilitate Bush. <laughs> like, full, no, like, no, he's already been to rehab, been to rehab. Now he needs to go to prison. Yeah, no. So, a very good question is oh, wait, so if he's not an innocent guy painting puppies, what's going on here? Here's what I think is going on I think okay. it's actually very simple. Okay, um, the Democrats need to open up a space, a rhetorical space, that all the Rom, the 2012 Romney rulers can inhabit. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You mentioned this. Yeah, yeah. so the, they are planning to purge leftists. Yep. And they need to replace those voters. And they need a rhetorical space. They're, they're trying to absorb the sane wing of the Republican Party. Right. So they want to absorb that section of the Republican Party. So they might have some, stand some chance of, of an electoral win. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hopefully in 2018 and, and possibly by 2020. That's what I think is happening. So it's a strategic move to... Uh, to continue to move the the Democratic Party right and open up a, a, a you know a safe space for uh, for sort of the and the, I won't even call them the sane wing of the Republican Party. I I, I want to be very specific. These yeah. are people who voted for Romney in 2012. Yeah, and could not. Uh, they were and the never could Trumpers. not vote for. They were never Trumpers. never Trumpers. They could not bring themselves to vote for Trump in 2016 because they're all about the civility and exactly and, um, those yeah. individuals. And I'm not going to refer to them as sane or insane or anything uh, else. Right. Okay. Um. Fair enough. They, their natural home. The, they're not the ones that are not openly Nazis. <laughs> they're not, yeah, they're not openly Nazis. Yeah. Um, and they need a place. Just, just fascist. But. Yeah. Just, just you know, sort of like a little low-level crypto fascism. Garden variety. Garden variety. Yeah. Um, those people need a political home, and the Democrats are trying to open up a space for them to be comfortable in the Democratic Party. If the Democrats continue to vilify. George Bush, whom these people voted for twice, and they frankly kind of liked him. Yeah, yeah. It's not going to be a good fit. Great guy to have a beer with and yeah. go to a barbecue. Yeah, yeah. when you want to move. And come on, 
we owe this guy an apology. Have you seen his post presidency where he's really blossomed? He's like helping the vets and everything, you know. Um. Um, so these folks need a place, a political home. Yeah. And the Democrats are trying to create one for them. So in the hopes that they will replace the leftists they purge and alienate mm-hmm. over the next two years. Which you have cunningly set up a segue into the next topic. Who did that? <laughs> Which is, um, <clears throat> I did not print out the the articles to read and, and quote from, which is probably just as well because I don't want to spend all night here. But um, the DNC has done a, a reorg in which they have removed a, a number of key people from committees Yep, and appointed a number of key people to committees. Yep, and I don't have the names and addresses in front of me, but the the upshot of it is that they're purging leftists. They're purging leftists, replacing them with lobbyists and um, yeah, you know, sort of operatives. They're re- removing people from key committees who were Sanders supporters. Yes, and they are appointing, literally appointing lobbyists as who are people who are going to be super delegates in the next election. That would be great. Literally lobbyists from the banking and healthcare industry. That's going to be awesome. Yeah. So here we are. And this is has to do with like uh the whole Perez versus Ellison, you know, yeah. struggle and all that. And but just in case you didn't know. Yeah. This is why they're going to lose in 2020. This is why they're going to lose more ground in 2018. You heard it here. I'm just saying. It really feels that way and, that they're and they're I doubling see, down. Yeah, they're doubling down. <clears throat> I think purges have begun. Well, I think they're trying to say, okay, we're going to alienate all these leftists, so we need. It doesn't these, matter. So we need the people on the right. It doesn't matter. So we need these people on the right. Yeah. They're trying to make that yeah. close that gap, right? I think what they don't fully realize <laughs> is how many people flat out left politics in 2016. Yeah, they just abandoned yeah. politics, and they're not going to vote. They're not going to come out and vote for you. Yeah. So they didn't just not vote for Trump, and they didn't vote for Clinton. They, they gave up. They gave up. Yeah. And they're not coming back. Yeah. The Republican Party had them, lost them, and the Democrats aren't going to get them. No, because they're still ethnically Republican. Right. They're still ethnically Republican. They're not gonna. They're not gonna. Yeah. Change. Yeah. And embrace anything Democrats are talking about because they're Democrats. Well, they've spent 40, 20, 40 years. 20, 30, 40 years just vilifying right. Democrats as liberals and whatnot. It, so, you and, know, that's not going to happen. Well, now they're not wrong. <laughs> now they're not wrong. I, I never thought they were to begin with. But no. the, the, and I think that's the miscalculation that Dem- Democrats are making is they think that they're, there's this sort of mythological person out there. They think that block of Romney blow. That block of Romney voters yeah. is larger than it is. Yeah, uh, the the, right. indi- so, the the independents, the so-called independents, so-called so. independents. Yeah, because th- those those Romney voters, a lot of them voted for Clinton in twenty sixteen. Mm-hmm. Um, not enough. Not, and and <laughs> so. and I think that should be the lesson they need to learn <laughs> is they're not they weren't enough to get Clinton in twenty sixteen. Right. They're not going to be enough in twenty eighteen or twenty twenty. And and we we have looked at each other and said, oh my god. Uh, and I, I think if you want to make predictions, I think there's a small but significant chance, and you yes. said this too, and I said, yes, I've been thinking this, that gonna they're going to run her again. They're going to run her again. I can't now, wait. I can't wait. It's... <laughs> Grace is not faking this. She's about ready to collapse on the floor. But no, she's... Ruffling. <laughs> Yeah, I think that could happen. And I, you know, I, I'm buying not, popcorn now. It's not, you know, it's. I don't think the decisions have been made. Uh, I don't know that she'll be in, in good enough health, honestly, to, you know, to, yeah. to run, but maybe. Yeah, well, yeah. She wasn't in that great health, health for the last election. Yeah, and you know. I'm at, we, we talked a lot about how some of these seats and whatnot are becoming a gerontocracy, right? Because yeah. we're not, we don't have term limits, and we're, but we're not getting young blood in. And to me, the worst offender being Pelosi. But, you know, so, not to be ageist so, per se. Sort of a West Coast Rom Thurman. <laughs> yeah, not to be ageist per se, but sometimes you need new ideas when your party needs, needs to be shaken up, yeah. you know, when the leadership needs to be shaken up. Yeah. And it's not just because of their age, but it's because she doesn't have any new ideas. She doesn't have any new ideas. Oh, and also just isn't... It's not, not responsive to... Not her, responsive to not her, responsive her constituency. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's really the issue. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and you can be responsive to your constituency at any age. You but, really can. But people are so 
uh, some Democrats are so um, double doubling down. I mean, yeah. the rhetoric on Twitter and whatnot is just yeah. ridiculous. It's absolutely ridiculous. I, I don't think they can see themselves. They cannot. And I, it, it, I think it's really possible that they might try to run Mother Clinton again. And, you know. And it's not going to go well for it's them. It's not going to go well. They're well, going to you know, hey, have their ass handed to them with both hands this time. Both hands. And, but, you know, hey, I could be wrong. I'm wrong all the time. <laughs> you are not. <laughs> <laughs> not when it comes to politics. Yeah, you, yeah. Usually you can't be cynical enough to be correct. You so, know, yeah. But so, so that's the DNC purge. Really. That's the DNC purge. Okay, our next topic is these, these uh, things that were trending on social media. The first was this um, related to the Weinstein, you know. Oh, that Weinstein debacle and the the Me Too was, and project. that is, that is women posting to social media Me Too saying, "I also have been raped, harassed, sexually harassed, profiled, assaulted." Ass- assaulted. Right. It, it's a wide. It's a wide range. Like it covers, uh, some people may use it to cover, you know, microaggressions or comments they find offensive that weren't intended to be of offensive or sexist work. discrimination, harassment, but writing up, right up to groping and, you know, and then, you know, rape, uh, you know, forcible rape and all this. Yeah. Uh, and you had a, you have been very hesitant to jump on this bandwagon and you had a great take on it. But you yeah. were really, actually, really mad. You were like staying up, not going to sleep because you couldn't. You were too mad. Too mad. And I, I wonder if you can talk well, th- about that. I think what was interesting for me is that I, I was like too mad, and I couldn't figure out why I was mad for like yeah, like three yeah. hours. This often happens. You got to like unpack your feelings <laughs> unpack about something. How I feel about. It. Um, and this this is um, not to say that that people don't have a right to tell their story or say what's going on for them. But to, so let's just dismiss that straight away everyone does yeah everyone has a right to say that um or say what they need to say and and to uh come out as a survivor as to come out as whomever they are the reason this made me angry is that yet again the onus is on women to point out that water is wet yeah yeah once again the onus is on women to, to say something to do something and seriously if you are actually too naive to know that this is a thing. Yeah. Um, I, I can't help you. I can't help you. And I, I've seen lots of men say, I had no idea. And I don't think they're lying. I think they're naive. I, I'm, not, I'm not calling these men liars. I think they were in a bubble. I think they were naive and, <clears throat> and in a bubble of their own making, to be honest. Yeah. Because you really have to craft your world carefully. To not see it. To not see this. Right. And sort of the question people ask about racism that I think is very relevant if as a man, it's never occurred to you how wonderful your life would be to live as a woman, <laughs> yeah. it's not that you don't understand the problem. Right. As a white person, you probably aren't thinking, oh, it'd be so great to be black. Well, people say bullshit like that. They're the like, same. oh, yeah, because you, be, you could get on welfare and drive a Cadillac and all, you know, get free you cell that. phones. You can do that uh, now. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you, don't, you don't need to be or black whatever, to do that. But, right. but no, this, uh, this idea... That oh my gosh I had no idea well of course you did right of course you did people are being disingenuous you just most, did, it most never of them. it never occurred to you to think of it it didn't spend time it didn't it didn't keep you up at night and seriously if it didn't if it's not keeping you up at night that women are raped harassed uh, and discriminated against you were asking me you said really you want to make this a topic you're going to go there you want to talk about it because if I start talking about sexism yeah. and misogyny I'll never stop talking about There's nothing it something else to talk about. There's not enough time for anything else. Yeah. And it's and so the idea that women need to do something so men know this is a problem. Well, now immediately all the women who haven't posted, like all the men in their social media, all the women on their social media are like, and dot, dot, dot. How about, you know, they're like, and you? And you? It's like, oh, come on. I know you have a... St-. But it, people, nobody should feel pressured. Pressured. To out anything about themselves, about themselves or, or because anyone. and oftentimes if you're doing this in social media, by definition you're probably outing people you who are also on social media yeah. with you, right? And maybe you're not ready to do that. And I understand. Yeah, no, I totally get that. Yeah. Um, but no, really, this is not something women need to do to explain to men. Yeah. How they objectify and oppress us. Right. That's actually not unclear. Yeah. Yeah, and and I know people like to make the case that it is. 
I think it's only true if you're really very naive and very committed to not empathizing with women. And to to the uh, it's like to the idea that we live in a post-racial society. We live in a post-sexism society. You know. Yeah. Whatever. Where do you get any of that? Like where? where like where? Why do you think that? Right. I mean, maybe you think that for some reason, but it's those are stupid reasons. One of my friends uh, made a post that I thought was was a good comment. He said, "I'm guilty." He said, "As all these women in my life are talking about their experience with harassment and whatnot, I should say that I've, you know, I have participated in this culture, and I think men need to to stand up and say, yeah. yes, I've been." part of the problem you know i'm trying that, to do better that would have been a more appropriate response i think to harvey weinstein for men to stand up and say you know this isn't just harvey it's it's me too uh-huh i've i've been doing this i've been letting this happen i've been standing there and watching it and not right. saying anything water's wet water's wet guys so so i've shared that i posted i said i said i've never forcibly raped anyone but you know for many years i going back to childhood right I engaged in behavior towards girls, women, you know, going back to childhood that was mm. deeply uh, obnoxious, misogynistic, Sex, sexist, sexist misogynist. all and, that. And, <clears throat> and was, was, was harassment. Was, was harassment. I mean, yeah. there were girls in high school, you know, mm-hmm. that I harassed. Mm-hmm. Um, so I can say... But what does that really do? I mean, I could say I'm sorry. I could say I don't believe that I do that as much anymore. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, people still think people are set in their ways by the time they're 50 years old. Yeah. You know, that's true. I I am let's let's just say I am much more conscious uh, and cautious mm. in my interactions with anyone in uh, an academic setting, a workplace setting, uh, so a casual social setting or mm-hmm. whatnot. And, but most of that, I think, is just because I got married. Oh, really? <laughs> well, not, <laughs> let, let, me, let me rephrase that. I mean, it's not so much that, that I got married per se and now I restrain myself because of that. Right. It's because my life has changed so much. Oh, right. you have a different life. <clears throat> I have a different life and... Because my relationship with you, which is now we've been married, we just celebrated our 16th wedding anniversary. Yeah. I don't think of being with you for that long has changed the way I think about women. Oh, right, right. You know, in a, in a profound way, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, have tried my best to, to hear them, mm-hmm. you know, and not just dismiss what they're saying. Right. Right. But I can't undo the uh, person you were. The workplace interactions I had with people, where at times I tried, I pressured people to date me, or mm-hmm. you know, I can't undo all that. And I'm not going to get on social media and start outing the people involved. Right. That's not helpful. That's not helpful. Well, I I think <clears throat> mainly you have a responsibility to your sons and your daughter to yeah. raise them differently. Yeah, I think that's true. I, I think that's that's what makes a difference. And I think there's a responsibility among men to call this behavior out because you see it all the time. Well, uh, in <laughs> these days I don't these because days you, don't. Uh, you know, I work in a, a engineering firm that's almost all men and we're all deeply nerdy. Yeah. Honestly, and we don't talk about much else than your nerdy stuff. Than our nerdy stuff. Your nerdy jobs. (laughs) Really. So it's not, it's very different Mm -hmm. um, than a, and that's partly a class thing too. Well, it's a class thing. And also, but there's a sexism thing in that, that there are no women in the engineering office. I can't fix that, but yes, that's true. It's true. Yeah. It's true. And I, I don't know. Um, I don't think you can fix it single-handedly. Yeah. And right? the, the women that do work in our company now in the assembly department, the way I feel like I can do my best to fix that or not be the problem at work is 
when I do work with them and interact with them, I'm trying to keep it about the stuff, you know, the stuff. and yeah. also trying to be encouraging and like, yeah, this, ha you know, uh, this happens, you know, this didn't work, this bill didn't work out right. But I just had an interesting conversation where uh, one of our staffers had assembled some pieces backwards, right? And oh, so, right, right. and it took a while to diagnose because it was such an odd problem that it's never happened before. Before, hopefully that's right. right. So we went down and I was like, she's like, oh, I'm sorry. And I'm like, you know, as long as we keep making new mistakes, I'm I'm more than happy with new mistakes. It's like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, new mistakes are always. Try not to make this like. Let's try. Let's all, just all try not to make the same, same mistake because that's when people are like not paying attention and whatnot. Right. But I can't criticize you for hooking this thing up backwards. Right. You know? but, yeah. Uh, well, I, and I so I think it's <clears throat> it's on you as a man to um, to keep the workplace environment as good as it can be. Yeah. Yeah. And and I don't think you can single-handedly change the dynamics of uh, software and engineering to bring more women into the workforce. No. But certainly, um, any opportunity you, or any role you play in hiring, there's an opportunity for you. Yeah, I have in previous jobs. Right. In this job, I really got nothing. Uh, yeah. I'm not engaged with that. But, you're not you part know. of that process. And also, I, as I understand it, your your job and the, your this particular field is so specific it's hard to find anybody, male or female. It's pretty. The embedded work I'm doing is pretty esoteric at yeah. this point. Yeah. So it's it's hard to find anyone who's doing it. Yeah. You know, I, if we could get, you know, anyway, there's, if we do ever have a budget for an intern or something, I'll be, you know, yeah, trying be to be as as you know, fair as open as possible to whoever yeah. we can find. But anyway. But no, the the. That I think that was my big takeaway with me too, is that again it, this becomes a something for women to do, as if as if we don't all know what's going on, and as if women don't already have all the emotional work to do. Right. So now uh, we got to do this. The emotional too labor, right? Yeah, there's more more for us to do. Now we've got yeah. to shame all, all everyone we know into saying, "Oh my God, I never knew that about you." You do <laughs> want to tell your story, and you're like, "Not really." Not really, you know. And you don't have to. No. Like, it's not. It's not your job to your fix job. to fix everyone else's attitudes. Nope. And so you know, I, yeah. I thought it was a good take. I mean, yeah. No, and if and if Weinstein's uh, the allegations against Weinstein aren't enough to wake Ben up, I don't know how something women are going to say is are going to wake Ben up, right? And right. as usual, right. This this has basically turned into become a white feminist thing. Yeah. Where. Yeah. The Me Too movement actually is ten years old and was started by black women as a personal interaction, not a not a social media thing. The, the, there was a specific woman who was like, who did this? Who did this? Like a decade ago. A decade ago. Yeah, I don't to remember her to name, encourage but... assault survivors to make a space for one another by saying that happened to me too. I believe you. Yeah. To speak to each other in that way. Yeah. Not as a forum to talk to men or it, it wasn't a social media thing. It was a, a, a live personal, in person. It was a personal therapeutic kind of personal healing, therapeutic thing, healing thing. Which, and very healing. Yeah. For survivors to know they're not alone. This isn't all in their head. Yeah. Uh, that this, this is actually happening to them in their workplaces and in their lives. A and it was very powerful, but somehow it doesn't become a thing until a white woman says it. Yeah. And now suddenly yeah. everybody's like, oh, I better do it now. Right. Um, as if, and then it, and it turns into something else, right? And it's not about supporting, you know, survivors supporting and healing each other, right? It's some other thing entirely. It's some other thing where again, it's more. I think it's more emotional labor more emotional for the women to women. take on, right? And fix everything. And if they're not willing to come out and say it, then they're cowardly, or whether there's or all these something. criticisms you can level. Right. And, and I, I, don't, I don't mean to say that anyone listening made those criticisms themselves, but right. I've seen that <clears throat> in. The right internets. in the in the in the woods in the wild of the internet. Yeah, Th that sentiment is out there. That you know you're somehow not. I don't even know what. Yeah. Uh, two two. Is it really two? Maybe I said one. But two <laughs> Maybe two it's things. Twelve. <laughs> two last things though on this. Um, number one, that I thought was a very good uh, little clip I read on my friend Susanna's page, was the one really good thing here mm -hmm. is that. Um, we as Americans apparently still have some 
shred of shared moral ground on of shame of shame and shared moral ground yeah that's and promising how wonderful is that that that's, that's good news <laughs> that's a uh, it really a good way to look yeah, at it. It really has been seeming for a long time that there's nothing left that we should. There's no bottom. To there's no bottom. How, how, how depraved, depraved we can be, and be like, yeah, well, you know, depravity happens, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so that we have shared grounds as Americans on some of these things, and that's really good news. Mm-hmm. And um, what was there was there was one other bit that I had here that was just my rage, maybe maybe it's just my rage. I don't know. <laughs> okay. I, I do want to mention one or two, uh, one yeah, twelve or fourteen. One uh, a quick aspect of this toxic masculinity, which is to say that I'm not sure women understand how boys were brought up. Oh, oh I remember the thing. Go ahead, go ahead. As yeah. far as the culture goes, that they were steeped in, especially yeah. if you grew up watching television in the seventies and eighties. Oh my god! Yeah, and I remember very keenly. Um, Seeing the the was it Budweiser the Swedish bikini team or yeah. something, and just basically women just used to literally to be draped over objects to sell them. Yes, the car ads. Like you whatnot. might have a curtain in the background. You know? <clears throat> yeah, right. You just drape a woman there. Yeah, and um, pornography was not at all the same as then as it is now. Mm-hmm. Pornography at the time did not, I think, influence me nearly as much as advertising, mm-hmm. and which was more pornographic than it is now i think yeah 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 and deeply sexist and just pervasive Mm -hmm. and um the other aspect of this toxic masculinity that i experienced growing up was that it was all about homophobia oh yeah and so that was basically if you were 16 years old and you weren't getting laid probably because you were gay Mm -hmm. you know so this was critical for you to prove that you weren't gay. Going back to eight years old. Yeah, you got to prove you're not gay. Go molest that seven-year-old girl. That's how we know you're not gay. That's how we know you're not gay. Yeah. And I'm not joking. Yeah. yeah. If, if, I'm, if, I'm only not joking, right? if only you were joking. If only you were Here's a. Here, now, here's a. This seems like a joke. The next little thing I'm going to say about. Um, there was a story being shared on Reddit of this woman was fed up with her boyfriend Mm -hmm. a young woman was posting uh saying he just will not wipe his bottom he will not wipe his rear end and he's leaving stripes on his underwear he's leaving stripes on the sheets um this is disgusting it's absolutely disgusting and i'm trying to figure out what he's doing and like why can't you wash your your butt and he says, literally, uh, it's it, no, it's good enough to just like soap the outside of my my butt and let the shower water run over it, and you you know you can't go between the cheeks. You can't ever go between the cheeks because that's gay. Oh, even he can't. So here's a guy who's being gay is dirty. <laughs> he's a functional, reasonably functional, like young adult. Can't touch his own ass. He can't soap up his own butt crack and wash it even to uh, make himself appealing to his girlfriend who's like in bed with him asking him to wash his ass because that would be gay yeah it can't be gay now that sounds like a joke but, but it's not a joke this ho- is a real homophobia guy. and toxic masculinity is that ridiculous is that and absurd? and that extreme that extreme yeah. It really is. Okay, you you were I said something earlier. You said, "Oh yeah, now I remember." Oh, yeah. Um did just an aside, and I I've, I've been strictly cautioned not to go into the abortion weeds. Oh, because I I've asked I've, I've asked you to just not make this show about abortion because we have you have so much to yeah, talk about and it's it's a topic we've done before. So Right. Um but this is something I think is really critical to we'll, connect. We'll do a whole show about it. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, This is absolutely critical to connect, and I think this is the moment to connect it, because people always look at me like I have three heads when I tell them that abortion is really about rape and our unwillingness to end it as a society. There was a great, there was a song um, by Consolidated uh, in the 90s called Typical Male, and I was pro, I had come out of college very strongly Mm pro-choice, and it was kind of a rap 
um, the chorus goes, a uh, typical male thinks with his dick. And then there, one of the verse bits was, a uh, typical male is pro-choice. You know, uh, why not? He, you know, he will impregnate women and doesn't want to deal with the consequences of fatherhood, right? And like and that, uh, that was like 90, 1990 or so I heard yeah, that. Yeah, I was yeah. out of college and I wasn't, and that was like, oh my God. It huh. struck me like, oh my God, that's right. That's right. You know, and so I, you know, I believe yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, and all this people, I know, I know people are like, well, women like to have sex too. Yeah, they do. Yes. Uh, that's, that's, not, that's not what I'm talking about here. There was just a high profile resignation of a, of a Republican official. Um, oh, right, where he was uh, pressuring his girl. He's a pro-life politician pressuring pro, his absolutely girlfriend. Absolutely pro-life, hardcore pro-life politician. But, uh, his but mistress. Pressuring, pressuring his, his mistress. mistress. Um, to get his, his girlfriend because he's married, right? Right. Um, to get an abortion to get rid of their love child. Their evidence. Their evidence. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it was such a scandal that he ended up, uh, he was going to not run again. He just resigned. He resigned. But, right. Um, but no, this is, this is the thing. People have all kinds of justifications, all kinds of things I like to say about, you know, the non-aggression principle, bodily and autonomy, all this stuff. The only place where you have a purchase, philosophically speaking, uh-huh. an abortion, is if a woman is pregnant and she did not choose to have sex in the first place. Yes. She yeah. didn't choose the sex freely. Yeah. Um, and really, whenever the, when you get to the nuts and bolts of it, um, and, and in the United States, abortion law is actually more radical or more uh, permissive, more liberal in the United States than just about anywhere else. Uh-huh. And what it comes down to is an assertion that, you know what, we're not going to do anything about rape. We're just not. Right. Women are going to have right. to put up with that. Right. And, if and that's, here's, the, here's the release valve. And here's the release valve. Yeah. We're going you to give them- You can always a, murder your child. You can always murder your child instead, and then you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. So yeah. so it, that's, that's, that's the, the connection. That's the wall they're up against, and that's the connection. And that's, the, that, that's it. That's, what, that's all it's about, really. Mm-hmm. Because- all those other things that if a woman is free to make whatever choices she likes as an adult and fully understands that any sexual activity that could lead to pregnancy, even with some kind of birth control, mm-hmm. could lead to pregnancy, mm-hmm. um, that doesn't mean that she's now free to kill her children. Yeah. Because she was free to enter or not enter into the act as an adult in consensual sex. Those, you're just saying, really saying those things should not be connected. Yeah, that's why would that be connected, right? Yeah. Unless we as a society have decided that women are going to regularly be in the position of pregnancy when they did not consent to the sex. Yes. And yeah. that's... Didn't take that, didn't take, didn't walk into taking that risk. Didn't walk into taking that risk. Eyes open. Right. And yeah. so that's, that's the decision we've made. And that's why abortion is so critical in the United States to so many people. Mm-hmm. It's that it's that safety valve. It's the safety valve that allows allows the evidence to disappear. Exactly. Uh, yeah, and that's the thing we don't want to talk about. Mm-hmm. We want to pretend that this is about sexual freedom and all these other things, and it's not. When women have sexual freedom, they just date younger men who put less pressure on them. That you were talking to me about that, I found that very interesting. That right. they date, literally date younger men because they they, have more they pro- feel like they they can say no to a younger men. Exactly. That was fascinating to me. So, um, yeah. Because I, I was dated older women. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So, that's what I got to say. Okay. So, those are our topics. Um, we have one last segment we're going to try and make a regular thing, which is... Uh, listener feedback. Listener feedback. Please send us some. Yeah. So, you can leave comments on our blogs. You can uh, talk to us on Facebook. Facebook. I'm on Twitter. You can listen yeah. to our YouTube channel. Oh yeah, a uh, uh, quick mention. We have um, uh, people have said, "Can you put these on YouTube?" And I'm like, "Why would I put audio files on YouTube?" And I'm like, well, a lot. Apparently, a lot of people listen to podcasts on YouTube. So, so it's on there. I've come up with a an easy way to turn the uh, podcast audio files into a video. It just has a single still image for the whole of thing. Of cute baby. Of cute baby. It's really just an audio only video. F- you but it's know. there. But it's there. So there are links on our site uh, to uh, to the YouTube channel. Yep. Okay. Have a good week. 
Have a good week. Thank you all for listening. I know this was an epic one. Epic. Honestly, we like the qu- problem wasn't having enough topics. It was having too, too many. many topics. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.